So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's with great pleasure and immense pride that I welcome you all to the webinar that we are hosting hosting today on the occasion of World uh, Oceans Day 2024. Uh, this event is being hosted by Maritime Research Center in collaboration with uh, Needs Money Technologies and Indo-Swiss Center of Excellence. Uh, today we come together as MRC interns, MRC fellows, MRC internal team members and distinguished guests and invitees to celebrate and reflect on the vital importance of ocean. World Oceans Day is a global reminder of ocean's crucial role in sustaining life on Earth, covering over 75% of the planet. Our oceans are the lifeblood of, to the ecosystem, the regulators of our climate, and the source of sustenance and livelihood for billions of people. This year's theme, which was set by United Nations, Awaken New Death, uh, Awaken New Death, highlights the urgent need for collective action to protect and restore the health of our ocean. At the Maritime Research Center, we are committed to advancing our understanding of marine ecosystem through cutting edge research, innovative technologies, and collaborative initiatives. Our dedicated team of researchers, fellows, interns, and partners work tirelessly to develop solutions that address the complex issues facing our oceans today. Today's webinar brings together a, di a diverse group of uh, experts, advocates, enthusiasts who share a common passion of uh, ocean conservation. Throughout the day, you will hear from our internal team members, our summer interns for the for 2024 batch, uh, who will shed light on the latest research findings, co conservation strategies, and policy development. We will also engage in thought-provoking thought discussions on how we can collectively contribute to the well-being of our oceans. Uh, to our MRC interns and fellows, you represent the next generation of ocean stewards. Your dedication and enthusiasm are vital for the continued success in our mission. Um, as we as we embark on this uh, journey together today, let us remember that the health of our ocean are intrinsically linked to the health of our planet. And uh, thank you all for joining us on this significant day today. Uh, let us be inspired, informed, and most importantly, united in our effort to protect and preserve the oceans. Welcome to the World Oceans Day webinar 2024. Uh, starting uh, starting with uh, today's uh, uh, World Oceans Day webinar, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Commander Arnav Bratz, who is the founder and director of the Maritime Research Center and Needs Technologies, uh, to share his welcome remark with all of us and guide us for today's presentations. Welcome, sir. Thank you, uh, Nishtar. Uh, happy World Ocean Day, firstly. And we are extremely honored to have a very special uh, guest, uh, uh, Dr. Satish Chinoy, sir, who is also the chairman of our research advisory board. And uh, Radhika, ma'am, is also uh, part of our <coughs> research advisory board. Uh, Dr. Shabana Burua uh, is also here. Uh, she is uh, from the strategic background and she joins us from ICWA. Uh, we have tried to see that we get different dimensions. And uh, Dr. Ramana Murthy, sir, uh, Director, National Center for Coastal Research, is uh, going to be joining us very soon. He's got a little problem in logging in, but I think that will get sorted out sooner. Uh, we were also expecting Purvaja, ma'am, uh, from, uh, she is the Director of National Center for Sustainable Ocean <coughs> Coastal Management, but uh, unfortunately, she is unwell, so she is not able to join. Uh, the World Ocean Day celebration uh, at MRC is typically to showcase the work that we are doing. And normally this is the time when we have our young interns also who join. And we've been doing this for a few years now. And uh, they present the work and it also we uh, take this as an opportunity to showcase the diverse kind of work that we do. Uh, just to give you a sense, uh, I just want to quickly share my screen and I'll just take very little time uh, just to remind you of the UDA framework and you can see the different cubes that uh, are represented in this. And uh, we try to see that our young interns populate the smaller cubes that you see. So diverse projects, uh, diverse multidisciplinary ideas are uh, kind of attempted here. And each of the project uh, takes a little while to mature. So our uh, way of working is very, very simple and straightforward. As soon as the intern joins, uh, we give him options of what kind of projects they could do. Uh, we are very happy to say that we get uh, 
very good uh, students. I mean, the interns, they come from very good institutes. This year, IIT Bombay, Kharagpur, Delhi, and uh, Chennai, we got uh, over 500 applications. And uh, it takes a, lo a lot of effort from my team to kind of select because we don't uh, want to take too many people so uh, because we want to give very personalized attention. So uh, we cut it down to much smaller number uh, so that we can have a one-to-one -one interaction. And it's a very intense. So some of the interns actually find it hard to continue because it's a very intense. Uh, I mean, my entire team is involved and uh, we have a very good uh, uh, set of uh, team which looks at all these aspects. So uh, what you can see is that all these projects First and foremost, after the intern has finalized the title of the project that they want to work on, uh, they embark on a literature survey, uh, which uh, culminates into a research note. So the research note basically gives a few of the research directions based on the literature survey that they do. Uh, we have probably almost 200 research notes already in our uh, knowledge center. And now we have also started another section, which is called the innovation notes. So if it is a very intense technology or technology development kind of a project, then they also go into an innovation note, which basically uh, specifically talks about uh, certain, uh, I mean, we could also call it a startup idea. Uh, so it has been, the innovation note has been designed in that manner. So after the res first research note is completed, the intern is then, uh, asked to finalize a flow chart, which basically defines the scope of work, having done the literature survey, and uh, also what kind of resources the intern would require to complete the project. And then they also write a small 1500 word article, which we call it the UDA Digest issue brief, which basically announces what this project is and what the project aims to achieve. Uh, and uh, that is published in our UDA Digest platform, which I think now has more than 120 uh, articles of different uh, types. Uh, you'll be given more inputs on that. And then they uh, move on. Once the project is very clearly defined, the scope is defined, then they move on to either a second research note. If it's a policy kind of a work, then it goes into another research note. But if it is a technology work, then it goes into an innovation note. And then at the end, uh, they would submit a, a short report, uh, which uh, kind of summarizes what they have done and how they, uh, what have they achieved. So this is a broad journey of an internship. And once uh, uh, they complete the internship, some of them also continue with us as a research fellow. So we are happy to, you'll be meeting uh, a couple of our uh, research fellows also, who, I mean, we have some of them who have been with us for more than two years now. and. Uh, so they look at something more serious and uh, they take it forward uh, from that perspective. And now uh, they are also guiding the next lot of interns. Uh, I mean, the uh, research fellows who have uh, spent enough time and they have a lot of experience. Uh, apart from me, Sridhar, Catherine, uh, uh, they, they also mentor some of the interns because it becomes more specific to their uh, domain. You will get a sense of all this that I'm trying to tell you. So... <clears throat> Now, the digital transformation has become a very, very important issue. So I want to just draw your attention to marine special planning. Uh, Shanoi sir and Ramana Murthy sir will definitely relate to this. Uh, that uh, This is now becoming a very, very important aspect. So we look at uh, marine special planning in a very, very different manner. We are focusing on the modeling and simulation approach because conventionally the Western approach is uh, data collection and uh, is very intense. Uh, sensor deployment, which is, uh, I feel, uh, very, very cost intensive and also <clears throat> hardware intensive, which is sometimes I would say it is not viable. So what we propose is a modeling and simulation based uh, approach followed by a uh, detailed uh, field experimental validation. So this is uh, one example of that where we have used AIS data to make this map and it also captures the local tropical conditions. So, uh, I mean, I just want to draw your attention how this is done. So the AIS data gives the complete shipping data uh, uh, and then uh, the vessel machinery details is taken from another database. These are 
all uh, available databases that are online databases that are uh, available and they are real time available on the other side you see uh, real time data available on from the itopo database and these are captured and the channel model is for the tropical waters is uh, computed and these both are combined to get what you see here so and then uh, you can uh, we validate this at certain location so something like an indian ez which is almost 3.7 million square kilometers can easily be mapped onto by using this kind of a method and this will be extremely cost effective and efficient so that's the approach we follow and that that is what you'll see different dimensions of msp as we move forward so i think i'll stop here not take too much time and i'll hand over back to nishtha thank you sir Thanks a lot for apprising us uh, of all the details that you just talked about. Uh, moving ahead, I would like to call, I would like to welcome Dr. Satish Shinoy, sir, uh, who is the member of MRC's Research and Advisory Board. Uh, a little bit introduction about uh, Dr. Satish Shinoy. He is currently serving as the Director of the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, INFOIS. Um, in recognition to his outstanding research contribution in the field of ocean sciences and technology, the Ministry of uh, Earth Sciences honored Dr. Satish Shinoy with the national award in the field of ocean science and technology for the year 2018. Uh, so thank, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Dr. Satish Shinoy. We would like to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and a very good afternoon to all the participants of this um, celebration of uh, World Ocean Day and uh, wish you all a happy World Ocean Day. At the outset, uh, let me thank uh, MRC, specifically Director uh, Commodore uh, Arna, Dr. Arnab Das, as well as um, other colleagues of his. Um, Mrs. Catherine is always uh, on touch with me for uh, such functions and um, provides all the information so thank thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me to join this uh, uh, celebration uh, just a small correction uh, i am former director of uh, inquiries uh, currently i am working as um, a chair professor of uh, ministry of earth sciences it's a post retirement uh, just uh, just to uh, uh, made it known to um all the participants uh, when we talked about the uh, world ocean day which was formally announced by the un general uh, general council uh, in 2008 uh, because uh, oceans are getting uh, more and more uh, prominence because of the uh, evolving uh, world order because uh, uh, in several aspects and uh, as we know that uh, the same oceans are coming under the under threat now of course the oceans are strategically important for uh, various reasons for trade uh, commerce etc etc and um, for the security and uh, uh, peacekeeping in the world itself uh, but the threat on the ocean has increased uh, more from uh, global warming and climate uh, change now and also because um, all the pollutants are finally ending up uh, in the oceans. So it is a bounden duty of all of us to look for a clean ocean free of plastic pollution because plastic is the major pollutant uh, um, which has been uh, uh, observed in the oceans till now. Of course, other chemicals are also pollute and uh, but uh, most of them remain uh, as a local pollutant rather than a uh, uh, worldwide uh, pollutant. But plastic is no longer like that because uh, first of all, the plastic cannot uh, degrade and uh, it has it never dies even uh, in our uh, four generations uh, lifetime. It uh, stays there. So it, uh, it goes uh, anywhere. It goes uh, uh, from uh, India to um, uh, uh, US or uh, Japan or somewhere uh, that far, as well as it goes down to 5,000 or 10,000 meters below the water column and pollutes the entire uh, water column. So I think we have to um, keep our uh, um, work as well as our efforts to keep a achieve a clean ocean free of uh, plastic pollution. 
and healthy and resilient ocean where marine ecosystems are understood protected restored and managed similarly a productive ocean supporting sustainable food supply because we all know that the oceans uh, provide the uh, uh, major chunk of food uh, what we consume especially the protein uh, in the form of uh, marine uh, fisheries uh, and other uh, mollusks and other forms so we have to um, uh, the ocean should be productive but at the same time it should be sustainable uh, uh, so that uh, we will not deplete the food what we are getting from the ocean and uh, we should be uh, putting our efforts to predict the ocean where we understand the ocean and we are we are able to predict the ocean actually that is the one of the uh, major job which uh, inquis is doing inquis provides this uh, day to day uh, predictions of uh, ocean state comprising of uh, what would be the uh, waves wave height wave direction wave periods as well as ocean currents uh, ocean temperature salinity um, like that uh, several parameters so we should be able to predict that uh, ocean so that we can conduct uh, uh, several planned activities as well as uh, we can have safe navigation and uh, safe uh, uh, fishing and those predictions are uh, right now used by uh, uh, from fishermen to oil and natural gas companies and they get uh, the benefit uh, of uh, 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 knowing the state of ocean in advance and planning uh, uh, planning their activities also we want a safe ocean where uh, the life in the ocean is uh, safe and the livelihood of the people who are depending on the ocean are uh, protected and they are they are uh, not uh, getting affected by the uh, by the depletion of the life in the ocean or uh, because as we know that uh, in india itself we are uh, about 40 000, uh, 40 lakhs uh, uh, not 40 000, 40 lakh uh, people who belong to the fishing community their entire life is depending on the fisheries uh, in this country so their uh, livelihood uh, should be protected so to protect that we should have abundant uh, fish and uh, not uh, depleting uh, from uh, the fisheries point of view so we should have a safe ocean and at the same time those who live on the coast uh, we know that uh, they are uh, uh, facing several hazards like uh, um, like the storm surges that is the most common hazard uh, which people uh, the, the coastal population is uh, facing and uh, uh, once in a while but it is more lethal the tsunamis in uh, in quiz uh, provides um, uh, predictions on uh, storm surges it uh, produce it uh, tells the coastal uh, uh, districts uh, where the storm surge is going to get affected and uh, what would be the effect like uh, how much it will uh, inundate that land and how far inside it will inundate so that um, the um, uh, disaster management agencies can take the necessary steps as well as the tsunami early warnings uh, are provided by uh, inquiries so that uh, our coastal communities not only the fishermen who are living on the coastal uh, areas there are other infrastructure other uh, uh, several uh, valuable infrastructure like uh, power plants and uh, ports and harbors uh, also, as well as other commercial activities and uh, townships for example uh, for three of our uh, metropolitan cities uh, calcutta Chennai and uh, Mumbai, uh, these three uh, largest cities of uh, India are located uh, right on the coast and they are uh, not very, uh, very, um, very much uh, higher uh, le uh, level than the sea level. So if uh, any of these assaults occur in those areas, the, not only the human life and human uh, loss, the uh, economic losses are also going to be uh, too high so we should be prepared for that uh, prediction and uh, how to deal with uh, such uh, situations so we should have a, a safety net for uh, to uh, cover all that and uh, our ocean should be accessible and uh, equitable access to data so that uh, if the data is free and uh, accessible to all researchers for example the centers like mrc 
you can also do research if data is not shared by other institutions or others so we have to advocate for and uh, uh, free flow of uh, data so that the knowledge can be derived from uh, because data is only data alone or uh, it's just a information but the knowledge has to be derived from that through the research by various researchers so that the centers like mrc or any other center also can uh, uh, get uh, get benefited so these are some of the issues which i think um, we had to keep in mind and uh, take it forward and we had to reiterate that uh, we will uh, work for uh, uh, these issues uh, on this uh, uh, day of uh, 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 world ocean day and uh, uh, before i conclude let me also mention about the uh, diversified work which uh, the mrc is uh, engaged in i see mrc's work in uh, three categories actually because of my association with mrc for the past uh, a few years and also um, getting the first hand information on uh, attending such a review meetings um, one is uh, the science there are uh, projects which are uh, working purely from the point of view of science and second category are uh, the technology driven uh, projects or the, they are trying to develop some or other uh, technologies and third is uh, more on the policy research especially the strategic importance i think this is a good uh, combination and uh, i haven't seen any other uh, uh, institution in india getting engaged uh, in all these three diversified uh, uh, kind of uh, topics and working uh, from the same uh, under the same roof uh, uh, to achieve uh, uh, all these um, um, all these three diversified uh, goals one is um, uh, policy research as well as technology and uh, science uh, uh, science uh, research and i wish uh, all the best for mrc on this occasion and look forward to listening to some of the um, uh, talks by the youngsters uh, who has already carried out of course i have uh, heard about uh, uh, most of the youngsters earlier as well but i am sure there are new students also in this group uh, for today's presentation so i will uh, uh, let me see how much i can prolong because i have another uh, meeting also to attend so i will uh, stay on for uh, as much i could um, otherwise please excuse me if i uh, if i log out uh, uh, in between because i had to join another meeting a uh, little later uh, so with these words uh, let me once again um, congratulate um, uh, mrc and its uh, staff as well as uh, director staff and uh, the students and interns who are uh, working uh, at mrc and i must also congratulate uh, or appreciate uh, director as well as the planners of uh, this function that instead of uh, keeping just one or two lectures they have asked the they are going to have a sort of a review actually on the celebrations day that is what we are supposed to do it is not that just a celebration we have to look back and uh, review what we have done and what we can uh, do and what we could have done so i think um, uh, this uh, planning is very good i appreciate that so with these words let me conclude and thank you namaskar jai hind thank you so much sir uh, really appreciate your comments and as you guided us sir uh, uh, we are also i mean we have divided our team into uh, three broad categories as you said uh, policy is definitely important but backed by technology so we have a technology team also and these are one of the best people uh, working in technology areas uh, and the third aspect is uh, we also have uh, we call them mrc engineers because uh, there's a lot of infrastructure required to carry on research so now we have in the last uh, one year uh, or maybe one and a half years we have started focusing on the back end infrastructure which will support the research although we are very small organization but uh, uh, my team led by uh, uh, shridhar prabhuraman he is unfortunately not well today so he is not here uh, but he uh, he has been focusing on the uh, infrastructure as well so you will get a flavor of the presentation has been planned in that manner that you will get a flavor of uh, all the 
different types of work uh, that we are doing. Uh, uh, before I hand it over back to uh, Nishtha, I would also like to warmly welcome Ramana Murthy, sir. Uh, he uh, could not join initially because of some technical issues. But uh, thank you very much, sir, for joining us. And uh, we take this opportunity to showcase our work to you. And uh, so I'll uh, hand over to Nishtha to take it forward. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, with this, we move on to the next segment, and we will have three presentations in the next segment, wherein the research engineers from the Malcolm Research Center will talk about their work and what they do in the backend work and the data analysis and other things that they do. So, firstly, I'd like to call upon uh, Ayush Sagar, who is a research engineer at, uh, at the Maritime Research Center. Uh, Ayush is going to be taking us through the program of the internship that happens at MRC, and also he'll talk briefly about the UDF platforms that we approved over the years. Ayush, you may take over. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Ayush Sawad, a research engineer at MRC. In my role, I focus on coordinating internships, managing our website, and organizing events. Today, I am excited to present an overview of our uh, prestigious internship program at the Maritime Research Center. And I will also give an overview on these four UDF platforms that we run. So the Maritime Research Center has its multiple internship uh, programs throughout the year. The internship could be for eight weeks, six months, and up to one uh, year for multidisciplinary students and also for uh, professionals and faculties who would like to upgrade their career opportunities. It will be a project-based program so uh, to expose the participants to multiple issues and aspects based on real-world problem solving. And now we have also came up with this structure that if a student or any professional is interested in doing internship, first they have to go through the e-learning modules, which is mandatory for internship. Then I am thrilled to announce that we have uh, also received 500 plus uh, applications from different IITs across uh, various domains for our uh, research intensive internships which span a duration of two months. Then our backend team shortlist this application, followed by two uh, rounds of interview. The first uh, interview is a communication round where we assess the student's interest and basic communication skills. Then second uh, is a technical round where we evaluate their technical expertise in their field of study and their knowledge of underwater basics. So once uh, they are selected, interns undergo a comprehensive uh, onboarding process. This includes orientation session led by our experienced uh, team and uh, all the information and resource, uh, resources are provided to help interns get started. So each intern is then assigned a specific real world uh, research topic to work on for the duration of the internship. Over these two months of uh, uh, internship, they have to submit their uh, uh, deliverables like uh, mind map submission, uh, three UDA digest issue briefs, innovation notes, a research paper and the final project pre presentation. After successfully completion of this internship, certificate and letter of appreciation uh, have also been awarded to the students. And interns, those who showcase outstanding performance, are also offered research fellowships. Then coming towards the uh, four uh, UDA platforms that we run, we have UDA Digest Learning Center, UDA Dialog, and Knowledge Center. So uh, going uh, to each platform, so this is the UDA Digest. Uh, it is a basically e-magazine uh, which was established in the year 2021. And by the time 2022, we started receiving articles from the experts of the domain. And it has four uh, formats. If you see issue briefs, commentaries, expert articles, and short reports. So only uh, the fact that these differ from each other are the word limits. Then um, around 100 plus articles have been populated over here in, a, in the different categories. Maritime security, blue economy, skilling in India, and this. And moving towards the next platform, uh, we have this learning center. So we have uh, created a series of uh, e-learning modules, which has also been populated on the government website. I got Karma Yogi, uh, the government website, and uh, it has been uh, uploaded to sens sensitize the uh, diplomats and bureaucrats. Then we have this uh, four uh, upcoming modules also that we will be populating soon. Then moving towards the next platform that is UDA Dialogue. So we have uh, conducted many uh, events, workshops, seminars. So all the video audio part has been uh, uploaded over here. So video has been divided in these uh, six categories, which has events, workshops, research, uh, entity product, expert talks, and upcoming events. So if you click on any of the category, you will see all the 
information uh, about uh, the events that we have conducted then if clicking on each event then you will see uh, a small information and an attached video uh, with it so moving towards uh, the next platform we have knowledge center so over 150 plus articles have been uh, uh, research notes have been uploaded uh, which has been done by interns and fellows along with the uh, innovation notes so uh, case studies uh, we will be populating soon and it is under harvard university model where real world problem solving is given in a proper way so with that uh, thank you thank you ayush uh, next, I would like to call on uh, Shreya Wagmare, who's, a, who's again a research engineer at the Maritime Research Center. And Shreya is going to be explaining about MRC's digital infrastructure. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Shreya Wagmare, and uh, I'm a mid level engineer at Maritime Research Center. And I manage the digital infrastructure at MRC. <clears throat> so today, I would like to talk about how the uh, digital infrastructure powers MRC's operations. Uh, which uh, makes us to function efficiently and effectively. And uh, I'll give you a small tour of what digital infrastructure is and uh, how it's a part of UDA and its uh, digital transformation. Also, I will uh, talk about the capacity and uh, capability uh, based on the digital systems. Uh, about the UDA and uh, digital transformation, my approach to this session will be solely based on the uh, digital infrastructure point of view. So moving ahead, uh, first I'll uh, give you an idea about what digital infrastructure is and uh, how it makes the difference. So uh, digital infrastructure is uh, like a foundation of services uh, or tools which uh, supports the use of each and every digital technology that we use daily. So like it includes everything like it is uh, cloud computing, whether storage, whether it is servers, so at MRC, digital infrastructure plays a very important role as uh, it reduces the offline management of all these hardware systems. And as you can see, all these uh, due to a digital based cloud infra cloud based infrastructure, we we can see the huge percentage difference uh, between what to do and uh, the I mean, how much capacity of research and uh, development can be increased through the uh, online digital infrastructure and it it uh, it reduces the management part of this hardware structure by a remarkable percentage also and uh, that actually makes a significant uh, difference in how MRC works. So to give you an idea, so this uh, the UDA framework, this figure, uh, it provides a clear path for stakeholders like uh, strategic security, digital transformation. So all of them to engage effectively and uh, collaboratively. So in which digital transformation plays a very important role in uh, acoustic capacity and uh, capability building. So the way Cube refers to the uh, sensing and analysis regulation. So it is all backed up by the support of uh, SIP and uh, secure di digital infrastructure. Now uh, let's see what are the components of infrastructure that enhances this uh, capacity and capability building. So as I mentioned, implementation of UDA framework, it is backed by a huge research team and innovation team, which includes uh, various research projects. So they mostly work on the real-time data processing, analysis, modeling, and simulation. And that requires a higher computing power as well as storage capacity also. And uh, that is actually available at a single click of a button. And this is possible due to the uh, integration of and use of this digital infrastructure and to mention uh, just few of them so to mention just few of them so one of the services that we use uh, for expanding the capacity of computing as well as storage so aws is uh, one of the services that are integrated into our projects also for data security and management so it is very important for each project and that is actually backed by the services like Bitbucket and GitHub, which also allows us to use uh, data repository and uh, control the versions of it, whether we have to use the current version or the older version of it. So also to sum it up, these services are actually bound up uh, by every member uh, at MRC, whether it is engineers or interns or uh, research fellows. So they are actually collaboratively working on a platform like uh, Microsoft Teams and their services. So MRC's vision uh, let all of us to continue to embrace and uh, utilize our digital infrastructure 
to the fullest uh, potential that it can give to us and uh, i would like to thank uh, i would like to end up uh, on a note that digital infrastructure is not just about the technology it is all about rethinking your entire business model and uh, thank you everyone and i wish a very happy world oceans day thank you thank you shreya next we move on to jay uh, jay pinjakar is also a uh, um mrc research engineer and uh, jay is going to be speaking about the uta database management so my name is jay bhanudas pinjaka i'm working as a research engineer at mrc so in mrc i am mostly handled the technical part related to the msp and along with the research work in it right. so going about the uh, uta data management so our vision at mrc is a uh, very simple and clear uh, to keep the data in accurate consistent and ac accessible along the all the organization by considering the compliance with uh, the uh, digital uh, data security also by understanding the, uh, its uh, scalability uh, so by considering the major aspect of marine spatial planning the data is a major thing that ne need to be managed in a very uh, accurate uh, way so we have the infrastructure uh, cloud based infrastructure way, uh, which was very secured and the ms uh, M, uh, msp that uh, mrc proposed is completely based on the modeling and simulation so we structure our data uh, by considering the modeling and simulation part so we divided the data in a two uh, major part that is uh, open source data and another one is a field data so in the uh, um, in open source data we have performed the modeling and simulation parts so uh, likewise the uh, upcoming interns are also going to talk about the advanced um collision avoidance systems uh, by using the uh, ais data and sar data mm -hmm. and one more project is there from using uh, the sar data uh, the detection of the uh, aquaculture ponds so that's how we build the model using this data uh, apart from the only the op open source data we have the uh, engage with the different organization so uh, that can be also uh, used to build our models Uh, going to the field data so according to whatever the project need to validate the model uh, that will be uh, so to validate the models uh, we uh, itself perform some validation data field uh, on field validations uh, also so likewise we did in the khara swasla dam uh, we also have the goa data sets and ganga uh, ganga uh, data sets also um, along with that uh, whatever the research has already happened uh so whatever the data source uh, or data sets are on field are uh, available on the trusted for platform so we also refer them likewise the ai triple data uh, sets are also available so this data is organized in a, such a way that it is accessible uh, to all uh, the entrants the researchers in a, a very uh, useful manner because uh, lots of uh, re rework is reduced by organization by organizing this data uh, and we ensure that at mrc the data will be uh, very in you know, a sure in a very secured way yes that's all for me thank you thank you jay uh, thanks to all who presented in the segment uh, we'll move on to the next segment now uh, we now we have the mrc project presentations and uh, all of the four project uh, all of the four like there are sets of presentations that we have uh, the topic number one for today is sediment management and uh, this topic is going to be led by the mrc fellow uh, romit kavre so now i'd like to call upon romit kavre who is uh, an mrc fellow and he started his done his studies from iit delhi uh, romit is going to be making a presentation on a topic which is going to be inclined towards uh, sediment management in tropical waters of the indian ocean uh, so hello everyone i am romit rajendra kavre so i'm working as a research fellow at mrc Uh, I graduated from IIT Delhi with a B.Tech in Civil Engineering, and now since the past two years, I have been working on the sediment management uh, in the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean. So that's what I'll discuss today. Uh, so the thing is, we talk about sediments. Sediments are of very crucial when we talk about the freshwater systems or the coastal dynamics as well. But how their dynamics uh, work, it's not clearly understood. In fact, the efficient management of the Uh, sediment holds economic social as well as uh, environmental consideration uh, now when we talk about the sediment management uh, it mostly 
uh, we are mostly focused on the two aspects, which is the sediment classification, which uh, I will talk about uh, later, and the sediment transport studies. Now, this sediment transport study is very much crucial in the global geochemical cycles. Uh, so, when we talk about the uh, land use, the uh, sediment erosion rates, human interventions, all of these emerge as a primary factor which influence the sediment influx into the various coastal uh, or the freshwater systems that are there. So when we talk about the sediment management, we are, we are mostly focused on the freshwater system and the coastal regions. So in the freshwater systems, we have the uh, major river basins that are there. We know the, uh, the Ganga and the Brahmaputra uh, uh, rivers. Now these very excessive sediments, uh, when we talk about the monsoon season is there, which leads to a lot of sedimentation, especially in the uh, Sundarban Delta region or in the Bay of Bengal region. Then there are the various reservoirs that are there. Due to the excess sedimentation, the Central Water Commission says that there is an annual reduction of 1.5% uh, storage uh, due to this sedimentation. This also has implications for water quality uh, when we talk about the inland water transport and all. Apart from that, when we talk about the coastal regions, uh, so there, there are various ports, uh, inland water transport is also there. And the sediment uh, management basically controls the operations of these uh, crucial uh, regions. Uh, it influences the navigation of efficient operations of the uh, of shipping, navigation and all. Apart from that, uh, they also house various estuaries, coral reefs, mangroves and other marine ecosystem hotspots are there. And uh, with the advanced, uh, with the high human uh, activities that are there in the exclusive economic zone, all of this pose a major challenge, including pollution, overfishing, uh, then there is the underwater radiated noise. All of this affect the uh, coastal regions. That way, these two uh, freshwater system and coastal regions needs to be separately understood. And now when we talk about the other aspect, that is the sediment classification. So it basically means we are trying to understand what is the seabed composed of, uh, what are the various sediment types, what are the various layers under the water of sediment. Now this plays a crucial role uh, when we talk about the various biotic and the abiotic uh, aspects of the marine ecosystem. We are mostly uh, working on the three uh, broad uh, applications. The first one is the sediment bearing pressure, uh, which is required for the foundation uh, Devel, uh, foundation design of the offshore uh, infrastructure like uh, there may be various oil rigs and all or offshore bridges and all then there is the uh, benthic ecosystem assessment which is basically understanding the mo or basically monitoring the well-being or the quality of the life at the uh, bottom most or near the seabed or the riverbed that is there and then is the abiotic element detection where we talk about the marine litter that is uh, suspended in the sediments or about the polymetallic nodules are there or offshore oil and gas exploration. So all of these applications come under the sediment classification and all of the monitoring and all is greatly affected by the uh, texture of the sediments, how is the distribution, basically the topography of the various sediments that are there. Another major task is understanding how the sediment uh, plays a crucial role in the dredging operations. So when we talk about the port systems or the inland waterways, uh, dredging is constantly taken up, but what we fail to understand is how does this uh, sediment dynamics affect uh, the constant dredging there uh, not due to the various coastal dynamics, water dynamics or uh, other human intervention, the, there might be a redistribution of the sediments which would require uh, dredging again and again. So annual dredging might be required. Now this is time consuming, uh, this is expensive as well and it affects the marine ecosystem and other, uh, and, uh, other channel uh, characteristics as well we have not been able to clearly understand how the sediment dynamics plays a crucial role in these dredging operations. So what is happening now with the advent of the internet of things, the 5D technologies there or artificial intelligence, we can have this real time data, uh, real time data feed can be done. So say we are having dredging operations, we can, we can directly have a real time feed of understanding how it is affecting the seabed or the or understand uh, understand how the marine ecosystem is getting affected similarly with this 5g technology we can have real time data sharing so we can identify what are the various stakeholders that are there uh, there might be operators then policy makers or the decision makers that are there we might be able to share that and with the rise of cloud computing we can uh, uh, cloud computing various data storages are there we can have real time uh, data analysis skills as well in order to have proper monitoring or proper and interpretations of the data that are being collected 
to make informed decisions uh, when we talk about data uh, we all know that without data we can't properly understand what is the current local situation and formulate holistic plans so collection of data can happen through various optical sensors are there we have acoustic sensors that are there that can be uh, on board the uh, remotely operated vehicles or the auvs are there large scale modeling and simulation tools have also been developed for a large scale understanding of the of our vast oceans but all of this uh, require a significant amount of data and as we know that the indian ocean lacks significant amount of data whenever uh, if i talk about even bathymetry as well the mh370 case shows that a mere uh, 2 to 3% of the seabed is being studied for bathymetry so indian ocean lacks the most basic data as well but when we talk about data collection and all we fail to understand what are the crucial tropical conditions now the indian ocean is more uh, is warmest amongst the uh, pacific ocean or the other major oceans or water bodies it's it contains rich biodiversity uh, it has uh, mangroves Uh, various coral reefs are there which again needs to be properly assessed and then the rise in human activities uh, it's a hub for global shipping oil and gas and there are various economic activities that are going on how they affect the uh, the working of the various various sensor we have the ambient noise that is being generated how this affect uh, the acoustic systems apart from that when we talk about acoustics the uh, the tropical waters the the so far depth which is very much crucial for the efficient underwater communication of the acoustic sy- uh, systems it lies at the greater depth in the tropical waters which leads to inefficient operations of the acoustic systems that are there thus whenever uh, the systems are being developed uh, we have challenges of background uh, noise which comes from the various biodiversity or from various economic activities that are there now this leads to the uh, problems in deployment calibration and maintenance Uh, there are various constraint for the uh, equipment and the operational cost of these acoustic sensors and thus whatever systems that have been mostly imported from other part of the globe the efficiency reduces to around 60 to 70% now what does it do it makes india reliant on the western technology rather than developing our own uh, systems thus what we are find, uh, trying to understand is for each of the applications of sediment management we can have this to see to understand to share model Uh, for the data collection so in 2c we can understand what are the various hardware requirements various sensors that are required for initial data collection and then once the data is collected we come to the to understand part uh, we see due to the noise fluctuation or the medium of, uh, medium propagation it may instill various uh, noise into the raw data how we are going to filter that data uh, uh, filter that data and then make it in a uh, and then make Uh, good interpretations from the data what are the various algorithms so we have machine learning algorithms uh, various noise filtering algorithms are there how are we going to apply them in order to interpret the specific data that we want for specific stakeholders and then once we are able to identify and understand the data how are we going to share this data do we have a common uh, integrated platform for that do uh, is there any particular graphical user interface we are going to understand that and this the uda helps us uh, in sensitizing the various stakeholders so we have the outreach phase where we reach out to the various decision makers or the policy makers hold various crucial workshops engage them with uh, the various policy and the technological interventions and finally with the help of the user academy and industry partnership we have skilling programs that are there in order to skill the future workforce which are going to take up these projects in the field Uh, then we integrate this with the marine special planning for better uh, for better decision making uh, the data the stakeholders all must be properly visualized and then be shared between the various stakeholders thus what are uh, what are we looking is understanding how can we collect uh, how can we go on with the data collection integrate them with the specific stakeholders have the policy objectives the technological interventions in order to form a holistic uh, integrated sediment management approach so this is uh, what our work has been there uh, with this side lengthy discussion uh, yeah thank you everyone thank you roman next can we please have pavan jain's presentation pavan is going to be speaking on sediment classification classification ml model and uh, pavan is currently working as an mrc intern and he's from it bomb hi i am pavan jain 
I am currently pursuing a B.Tech from IIT Bombay. I have completed my second year and I am currently pursuing a research internship from the Specialty Institute, Maritime Business Centre. And I have been added research a research project here, which is basically to provide another path to the problem, which is known as sediment classification. So now I will be explaining a bit about my project. It's uh, mainly a data science project and it is based on the Khadak Vasla Lake data which was collected in 2019. At the time it was collected with a purpose to solve which is obviously sediment classification, but the method to achieve that was done using mathematical models uh, such as energy time model or reflection coefficient models, which are basically very heavy mathematical models. A lot of post processing of the data was done to get the final results. So now what my aim of my, now what my aim is to use machine learning algorithms to use this data to provide another alternative to this problem. So that it can reduce time and can and can also provide us an easy uh, easy method. Now, before I move ahead with my project, I would also like to tell like to tell you about the exactly importance of it. So, sediment classification is basically classification of sediment layers, which uh, I was explaining as well, and and Roman sir also explained as well. So now here, what we are doing in the left, you can see the methods which I use presently to do sediment classification, which is remote sensing, uh, uh, image analysis. Then we have a diffraction, we have green CV. These are the methods I use presently. These are more physical methods, and again, they require extensive post processing. Now, what I will be using will be based on neural networks and support vector machines, which are basically uh, ML types. So, now what will be my roadmap for this project? Now, my project uh, output will be mainly based on five inputs, which is time of reflection, amplitude of reflected signals, energy of reflected signals, reflection coefficients, frequency of sonar waves. Now all of these can be calculated from the data, which is the date, the form of data you can see on the top right corner. So basically, I've been handed signal amplitude values from the sub bottom profile, which was the instrument used to collect the data. Now using the Hamiltonian transform, we can calculate all these values which are mentioned on the top left. And later, I would be dividing this data into different parts to get my training data, testing data, and validation data for my final ML project. Currently, I'm in my uh, currently I'm in my knowledge collection phase where I am trying to understand what the data exactly is and trying to calculate these values of parameters and I am moving ahead to the course of this intervention. Now this my project holds a lot of future potential such as it can uh, in the future if it is successful one type of data we can incorporate other types of data. Also we can we will need to increase the accuracy of algorithms such that it can be used for high level research operations. Now another issue with sediment classification on any research method is which is based on ground is that it requires a lot of physical costs and time. Uh, so if we use methods which do not require that much on, uh, on physical interference such as remote sensing, then we can also eliminate the issue of physical data collection. This can all be done remotely, which will be a very big change in the methods for calculating sediment classification. So now I would like to end my presentation. Thank you for listening to me. Thanks. Thanks, Bhavan. Next, can we move on to Pradnaya Kumbre from IIT Bombay? Uh, Pradnaya is going to be speaking on the topic sed sediment management transport study. Hello, everyone. I'm Pradnaya Kumbhari. Uh, currently, a research intern at Maritime Research Center. And uh, I'm currently third year undergraduate from uh, in Electrical Engineering Department. And today, I'll be talking about sediment transport study. So, let us first discuss why sediment transport is important. So the monsoon season in India, it contributes significantly in excessive sedimentation. Let's uh, take, for example, the Ganga River. The Ganga River is one of the world's largest sediment dispersal system, uh, transporting an extremely high suspended uh, sediment load along with it. And uh, the sediment built up during this process, it impacts our uh, water bodies significantly. Our reservoirs are losing their uh, storage capacity, and it is not only about the reduced water storage, but it also increases the flood risk. Hence, addressing uh, the sediment management is extremely important for preserving our environment and ensuring the economic stability. Let us see what are the critical aspects and the effects of erosion in sediment transport. So, as I mentioned in my previous slide as well, the Indian tropical rivers that, that are responsible for bringing a large quantity of sediment as a result, it causes immense erosion. Now, erosion and aggradation, these are two most important geological processes. These are the natural forces that are responsible for bringing down large amounts of sediments. Now, as the water flows, uh, it, it transports more sed sediment along with it if it has more kinetic energy. 
it not only affects in rising river beds but it also causes drainage congestion uh, it affects water flow and erosion let's move to who are the various stakeholders in managing the sediment transport this include government agencies that are responsible for uh, environmental protection managing water resources uh, we we also have environmental organization that focus on preserving habitat and improving the quality of water there are local communities who are dependent on rivers for fishing agriculture and transportation there are many more stakeholders that are involved in uh, sediment transport i have just listed few of them let us uh, see uh, the sediment management simulation models so in my research project i plan to use various simulation models for uh, studying uh, sediment dynamics mainly focusing on three case studies that are brahmaputra basin jnpt port and the managing this sediment in these cases are extremely important for ensuring the economic stability i'll employ hetras model for brahmaputra basin and well trading model for jnpt port and coach lastly let's move to the uh, overview of future scope to minimize the sediment transport initial step is tackling the sediment issue uh, by watershed management by combining various engineering and bioengineering techniques we can address the root cause of incoming sediments also managing uh, already deposited sediments within the rivers it requires innovative solutions like uh, sediment bypass and sediment pass through interventions a remarkable uh, solution is being uh, carried out by researchers that is the bypass tunnels these uh, bypass tunnels uh, can reduce sedimentation by 80 to 90% according to studies yeah that's it from my side thank you everyone for listening to me have a great evening thanks padmaya now in this in this set of presentations that we are going through i'd like to call upon s arora nagran from mt kharagpur um he, he's going to be speaking on sediment management focused on dredging arun we can take over and you can start your presentation uh, hello everyone uh, my name is arulan nandan i'm a third year undergraduate student from the department of electrical engineering at iit kharagpur i'm currently a research intern at mrc my project topic is sediment management focused on dredging um first let's understand the importance of dredging in tropical regions excessive sedimentation is a common issue that reduces the depth of water channels which are crucial for navigation and the economy the sedimentation issue can also impact uh, the normal functioning of ports and harbors dredging helps in these situations by removing the excess sediments from the water channels ports and harbors and thereby ensuring proper navigation but dredging shouldn't always be the go to answer to these problems as they are very expensive and can cause major degradation in the local benthic ecosystem if done without proper planning Um, my field of research is an understanding how to make the whole process more efficient and sustainable um for example application of uda framework to the process of dredging will be helpful in various ways by using the uda framework we can formulate guidelines and can build up a structured approach towards the problems faced during dredging um for example uh, understanding stakeholders is a big part in planning and designing phase of dredging which can be facilitated by the uda framework as we know dredging has diverse impacts on economy ecology and the local communities uh, we should develop practices and measures to reduce these impacts in various parts of the world different methods are used to tackle these problems and since western waters are different from more trop tropical indian conditions uh, many of these methods and practices may be inefficient if deployed in india therefore a study must be conducted focusing on our indian conditions to reduce these impacts uh, let's take a case study that i have done focused on a certain water channel in brazil uh, the sediment obtained from dredging proved to be uh, unfit for direct oceanic disposal uh, so they have so they have adopted a strategy of confined aquatic disposal which hasn't been implemented in indian waters this method is proven to be an effective and sustainable solution for sediment disposal as harm done to the local aquatic ecosystem is minimized and considering brazil is a tropical country like us uh, these methods of sediment disposal can be adapted to our indian waters in the future and here are some other methods that i have observed from my case studies for example confined disposal facility is similar to confined aquatic disposal 
but uh, CDF is done on land and uh, pneumatic flow tube mixing is a method to convert fine sediments or tin from dredging into useful materials that are used for construction and other economic uses. And uh, mitigation banking is a method that is often used in western regions. The concept behind this method is understanding the harm done to a region and compensating with improvement and uh, preservation of ecosystem in a different region thereby reducing the net harm done to this environment. I am currently researching and calibrating these methods tailoring to our Indian conditions. Thank you. Thank you all. So with this we end with the first uh, topic of the day which was sediment management. Next we are going to move on to the next topic which is ESG, climate change and blue economy. Uh, for this I would like to call upon uh, Catherine J who is the Head of Publications and Research at uh, the Maritime Research Center. Uh, Catherine is going to be speaking on the topic, topic related to blue economy in the Indian Ocean region. Catherine, you can take over. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine. I am uh, currently heading the Research and Publication Department at Maritime Research Center. Um, I've been, uh, associ I've been, I have been associated with uh, IMRC for the past couple of years. And um, and I've also done considerable amount of work on marine spatial planning and blue economy from the policy perspective, uh, trying to integrate uh, the policy and technological aspects of blue economy. In this particular presentation, I will be focusing on how uh, UDA can be used to enhance blue economy in India. So a framework for blue economy goals and integrated sustainable ocean management. In this presentation, I'll be covering uh, briefly the background various challenges in blue economy and uh, why UD and what are the benefits of this approach and the future scope. So uh, talking about the background, the concept of blue economy isn't new and it has been there, uh, have been developing in steps since the 1970s uh, Stockholm conference. And after that, uh, the adoption of uh, United Nations Law of the Sea gave another impetus to the whole uh, uh, initiative. And uh, various other conferences and reiteration of uh, the goals has happened uh, throughout the years. Uh, and recently, in uh, 2020, we, uh, the United Nations declared um, this particular decade as Decade of Oceans which uh, has given uh, an additional importance and uh, attention to the ocean economy and ocean sustainability. And uh, following that, we've had a lot of collaborations, a lot of other conferences to talk about, uh, to implement and to plan various initiatives. Um, and um, today, India's maritime resources is one of the major untapped uh, resources uh, in India. After having um, used up uh, pretty much uh, gone to the limit of uh, the land resources. We are now not just us globally, everybody's looking to the oceans for various resources, food, medicine, uh, energy, etc. And uh, our economic zones are vast um, because of our, our vast coastline. And uh, there's a lot of potential and opportunity to, uh, to take initiatives to uh, make sure that our growing population is indeed catered to. Uh, sustainably. Uh, various key sectors, as I mentioned, are fisheries, shipping, uh, energy uh, sector, the offshore energy, renewable energy sectors, uh, biotechnology sector, um, uh, medicine, etc. So I would like to uh, bring your focus to the, um, the the recent report by UNESCO, State of the Ocean Report 2024. On page 69, um, I find this uh, statement, persistent gaps in the ocean observing system, both spatially and thematically remain and there is also in there are gaps and there is also an urgent societal need for more ocean observations to manage risk and adapt to change in ocean and weather systems and support sustainable blue economic growth so um why this statement we already have i mean the ocean is vast is this a viable solution you know we're getting more ocean observing system is it viable uh, are we working smartly or are we just uh, deploying sensors and various other uh, satellite uh, to capture images um, without knowing what to do with all of that data? So what is the smart work that we are missing here? So what we are expecting is, according to the five pillars of New Ocean Agenda, is uh, ocean wealth, ocean health, ocean equity, ocean knowledge, 
ocean finance. These are the expectations that we've drawn. And what is the reality? Um, we are still faced with a lot of environmental threats. We are still faced with a lot of infrastructure burdens uh, for the oceans. Uh, just as I mentioned, a lot of observation of observational uh, platforms, etc., and the failures related to that. Uh, it's pretty obvious that the more number of observation stations you're, you're trying to deploy, the number of failures, the number of accidents are also going to be increasing without proper uh, planning or proper, um, proper idea of what, what we are getting into. And uh, then data gaps and inadequate monitoring, lack of capability. Although we, uh, although we have a lot of area to cover, do we have the capacity and the capability to cater to all of that uh, in terms of uh, the science, in terms of the technology, um, uh, et cetera? Uh, and then the stakeholder miscommunications. The stakeholders are diverse. So uh, there are, uh, because of the lack of data, the lack of capability and understanding, uh, there is a lot of miscommunication, which will definitely lead to inefficiency. So. Uh, the law, uh, uh, all of these initiatives, a sustainable ocean economy for 2050, the future of food for the sea, from the sea, the ocean as a solution to climate change. So in all of this, where is the underwater awareness? So there are um, three kinds of data we can uh, capture from the oceans, surface, subsurface, and underwater perspectives. So till now, we've been uh, actually looking at uh, the ocean from the perspective of the land. So instead of going from the land, why don't we look at it from the ocean's perspective? So from the deep waters to what is out, outside. So when we look at it that way, the kind of data that we want to capture, the kind of data uh, ranging from uh, the satellite imagery, the, the seabed data, the uh, other acoustic uh, data, uh, the um, data from the AUVs, etc. So we have all this data. We've been doing a lot of it in silos. but uh, the perspective hasn't changed. We are still looking at all of it from above water. So uh, the knowledge generation uh, should also be focused from what we have uh, uh, underwater to uh, what's on uh, above water. So the whole uh, the, the line of thinking, if we kind of shift it, then our marine spatial plans and the national, uh, the regional plans will all cater to sustainability more than catering to the economy. Uh, although both of them have uh, substantial importance, but um, if we don't uh, take care of the environment, um, the, the uh, economy will definitely die off after a point of time. So sustainability is definitely a key import, uh, factor. And um, if we don't focus on underwater, uh, the, bio, the biodiversity within water is definitely going to suffer. And all of this would require a new kind of capacity, a new kind of capability. And uh, this uh, approach is uh, being offered by the underwater domain awareness, where instead of uh, focusing on and uh, collecting all of that data isn't uh, possible, it's an impossible task. So the best way to go about it is modeling and simulation and using the open access data uh, itself and various other kind of qualitative data as well. So qualitative data till now has not been used efficiently to make uh, plans when it comes to uh, ocean management. Uh, data, socioeconomic data, data on um, the uh, from the satellite imagery, uh, uh, et cetera. Even though it's been used, uh, I think um, an interdisciplinary integration with, um, uh, with a lot of um, focus on uh, uh, what uh, the end goal, which is uh, making sure that we are sustainably using the uh, ocean uh, resources is something that's been missing. So underwater domain awareness uh, focuses on modeling and simulation and interdisciplinary in integration of data, which is possible through uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then subsequently leading, uh, we can take it forward with field validation. So the field validation will involve um, it, it, it isn't uh, resource intensive, but will give you the uh, expected results. And uh, capacity and capability building is also an integral part of UDA. So the benefits of UDA includes uh, it's economical and efficient, it's time saving. Uh, it helps you make informed decisions, uh, predictive analysis. Uh, it's cost effective, uh, uh, leads to cost effective planning, uh, gives you adaptive management uh, strategies. Uh, it's resilient and uh, accessible to a uh, lot of stakeholders. 
So the application is that we have a lot of emergency scenarios where we need quick, uh, 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 quick solutions and you know quick thinking, which is not possible with just deploying a lot of um, resources out there without integrating uh, all of that data properly. And uh, uh, the conservation efforts is also aided by UDA, uh, stakeholder management and participation, and livelihood generation. So with future outlook, if we integrate UDA with the national policies, not just blue economy policies, the fisheries, the sediment management, et cetera, we can uh, get a, uh, a, a holistic understanding of what is out there and, uh, and will lead to a thinking uh, from the sea to the land perspective. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, in the future, we are also looking at skilling uh, and uh, uh, livelihood generation uh, in all three categories, research, technology, and the deployment stuff. So this will lead to a lot of um, socioeconomic benefits to the coastal communities as well. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, next, can we have Akash Prasad from IT Bombay uh, to make the presentation? Akash is going to be speaking on stati statistical inference of climate change impact in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, sure, Nishka. So uh, first of all, a very good evening to all, to the panel. My name is Akash and currently I'm a third year undergrad student uh, from IITB and I'm pursuing my uh, majors in material science. As an as a intern at MRC, I'm working on the project, uh, the climate change in the Indian Oceans and how it has impacted the economic activities over the years and its forecasts. So first, I would like to start uh, with the, our current scenario and what are the potential threats of the climate change. So uh, I would like, uh, first I would like to highlight the current scenario, okay? So based on the suggestion of some famous reports like IPCC and the World Economic For Forum, it is very much uh, imperative uh, for us to restrict the temperature change of the globe by uh, one, uh, below the 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of century. Uh, in fact, the anthropogenic emission of the CO2, which is happening due to the uh, industrializations and many other things, should decline by 43% and it should peak by 2025, right? And uh, and in the scenario, if we fail to achieve this target, then it may lead to the trigger of the climate tipping point, uh, which is referred to the threshold change in the climate after which the change is uh, irreversible. So yeah, so major threats of this uh, climate tipping point could include, uh, that is the melting of the ice sheets from Greenland and Antarctica sheets, which may lead to the high sea levels and ultimately cause floods and other uh, change in the weather pattern. And if we uh, like uh, fail to resume, uh, huh, reduce the sea surface temperature by two degrees by the end of the century, so there would be a sea level rise of course of 0.5 meter. So like we heard, like we are hearing like there are many kind of uh, organizations like COP and various uh, agreement like Paris agreement and related stuffs are getting passed, but uh, man, uh, but no major impact has been seen on the ground level up till now. So uh, this is a problem of concern. And if we talk about the, if we talk about the underwater domain, so major chunk of the blue economy uh, for any country is contributed from the underwater resources itself. And uh, uh, a slight, but in a slight change in the underwater temperature can lead to the various kind of uh, harm, harm to the underwater ecosystem for example a slight change in the uh, slight change in the temperature may lead to the coral bleach and it may have further cascading unfavor unfavorable consequences from depletions of high quality fisheries uh, productions to the degradation in the seaweed cultivations and yeah right the underwater uh, domain is getting affected in form of the ocean acidifications or the uh, rise in the temperature and the dissolved o2 concentration being decreased so there's a huge, and in fact, it has been predicted, uh, right? If the scenario remains the same, there would be a decline in the fashion production by the 21%, and which will lead to the loss of around 300 million, uh, 300 million uh, pounds by 2050. So I have uh, like plot, I have like included a plot of the time series for the ocean heat content. So what is happening? Climate change had led to an increase in the net uh, ocean heat content over the years and it is like visible from the graph the there's a positive net heat content over the years which is quite concerning and if you see uh, to the world map and we can see uh, we can have uh, like uh, a look 
that the in fact the tropical waters and all compared to them uh compared to other waters let's say temperate and ar arctic have more uh ocean heat content and ocean heat content may lead to the decrease in the oxygen concentrations as well as the phytoplankton which are essential nutrition for the fishes and other creature to grow and uh yeah so uh like also the rising uh ocean heat content has like degraded the quality of the habitable zone for them and forcing them to migrate to some other places and hence the fishing uh production for any country is affected due to this so first of all i would also like to uh, uh like to highlight why it is in fact important for the indian ocean uh, to deal this climate change as we know like as in the previous slide i mentioned about the uh, more uh, ocean heat content in the tropical and in fact if we go from the facts uh, other stats the net ocean heat content is more for the uh, iowa region itself and because the increasing uh, demand for the iowa region both from the economic and the strategic point of view so uh, it uh, the world power is shifting toward it and in fact the iowa itself ser serves around the one third the population of uh, 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 world third world population uh, being only to be 20% of the earth surface so but uh, there is still uh, uh, inadequacy of the technology for monitoring and uh, policy framework and the existing policies are very much influenced by the western power so we have to build a framework to deal with it in fact the uda framework which is uh, proven to be very much efficient for addressing this problem so i would take some time to explain what the uda framework is so uda framework as we can see there are four different section the first one is the capacity building and collaboration with the community right uh, which includes uh, involving the right stakeholders and right stakeholders and uh, uh, right and taking uh, actions for the upskilling next is the digital transformation involve the planting sensors to collect the data parameter for the ocean parameters and this will help to plan uh, Of, to offset any potential threat and uh, next is the uh, marine spatial uh, planning which is a, pres a precise mapping of the resources under water this approach will help proceed in the proper planning and take care of any important resource right and the last one is the surveillance and the connect uh, con which uh, surveillance and monitoring which uh, refers to the continuous mo monitoring required uh, required for the ocean so with that i would like to conclude my presentations and like to wish everyone a, a world happy world ocean day thank you thanks sipash uh next can we have anjali kumari from iit kharagpur uh, she is going to be presenting on the topic water resource management so first of all uh, good evening everyone present here uh, my name is anjali and i am a third year undergraduate student in the department of chemistry at iit kharagpur currently i am working as a research intern at maritime research center and my research topic is water quality management system so today i'd like to present a short presentation uh, regarding my work so the topic for uh, today's presentation is water quality in india a contemporary uh, perspective so moving to the next slide uh, so uh, i have been researching since last month and had a lot of uh, literature survey on this topic uh, from uh, different institutions like iit kanpur and research uh, reports from uh, center board of pollution control uh, etc uh, there i found that uh, 70% of uh, india surface uh, water has already been contaminated and i found that a uh, huge uh, there uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, factors that affect the water quality and among them uh, uh among them uh one of the uh, key factor uh, is increasing urbanization that is uh, basically the industri industrialization where we are using uh, fresh water basically the in fact the drinking water which is uh, not in essential uh, for industrial purposes then what is the importance of my uh, topic that is to ensure safe drinking water a sustainable agriculture and healthy ecosystem then my goal is to identify uh, key pollution sources uh, assess its impacts and propose optimal solutions for that then uh, what are the significance uh, to protect public health support economic growth and preserve natural resources so now uh, what are the optimal uh, solutions for a water quality management system system 
so as a we already know that there are already uh, a lot of technological interventions that have taken place, uh, which aim to integrate advanced technologies for a water quality management system. But what we and different stakeholders need to understand that uh, the, the policies and the frameworks that are written on the papers need to be uh, forward in real and at a ground level because it has already been too late to focus on this also and we need to have that fear of uh, uh, huge hot scat, uh, scarcity by the next few months. Uh, so uh, what my approach for this is that first of all I had a, a rigorous research on the topic where I wherein I uh, had uh, gone through a lot of research reports, existing methods and available data uh, and currently I'm analyzing uh, what are the technological and policy gaps uh, uh, in those uh, available uh, methods and data. And finally, I would be uh, uh, proposing if there are some better solutions for, for the existing, uh, for the existing uh, solutions that are available. If yes, then I would be incorporating in my uh, research mode and yeah, uh, however, uh, the best solution could be uh, nothing better than the prevention of the cure. So uh, we need to uh, understand the seriousness of this problem. So uh, finally, uh, what are the future scopes of this solution? So uh, once I uh, complete my uh, research and I'm at the stage of proposing uh, some unique solutions to those, I would be incorporating them with the UDA framework, which has uh, four components like uh, due economy, uh, strategy, security, uh, digital transformation, and sustainability and climate change. So with this, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation for today. Thank you for uh, your attention and have a, a very happy uh, World Social Day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Anjali. Uh, next, uh, so this was the end. Uh, Anjali was concluding the set of presentations for the topic uh, ESG climate change and water resources. Next, we'll move on to the next topic, which is uh, digital transformation. And uh, this topic is going to be led by Shlok Nimani. Uh, Shlok is a fellow at MRC and he's done his studies from IIT Bombay previously. Shlok was an intern like the, like some of the interns that you can see right now. He was also one of the interns, but currently Shok works as a fellow at MRC. And in today's presentation, he's going to be speaking about digital transformation for sustainable economy. Shlok, you may take over. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation on digital transformation for sustainable economy. Myself, Shlok Nimani. I am a research fellow at uh, MRC. Uh, I am with MRC for over uh, around two years, and uh, I have been completing my B.Tech and M.Tech from Electrical Engineering from IIT Bombay will be graduating very soon. So here, why are we even talking about all this? Why have I started talking about the blue economy, the sustainable economy? So here uh, on the left hand side, one can see how the overall production of shrimp in India have been increasing in the past decade. So this all has been attributed to the introduction of Panama shrimp. On the second end, on the bottom right, bottom left, one can see on the global scale, the shrimp production over the years. So there has been a, a monotonic increase over the years. But the idea is, what is the share of aquaculture versus the capture fisheries? In so here, we are not only talking up as per the shrimp, but the idea is, in the past uh, three to four years, we are seeing a very much interest of the parties as well as the government organizations toward the growth of fisheries and aquaculture in India. So here, as the director of IPAD and CMFRI, uh, Gopal Krishnan, sir, has mentioned that India has the potential of producing about 10 million metric tons of seaweed. And uh, you will be like astonished by seeing the number which we are currently producing as per the last financial year, which is roughly about 35,000 metric tons. But uh, on the better note, we are touching our all-time high exports of seafood worth 8 billion uh, US dollars. And uh, the frozen shrimp, why even I am very much uh, interested in this particular species or the or, uh, organism is like, uh, it remained to be the major contributor to the total export basket. We export our shrimps not only to China, uh, but uh, also to the West. And uh, this, our blue economy policy of 2020, it mentioned how India need to bind to global IUU regulations 
as well as the changing climate condition in iowr as uh, my colleague akash has pointed out that uh, change in sea surface temperature can have a significant impact on change in the potential fishing so india is pushing towards the mariculture aquaculture and the seaweed farming in terms of economy and uh, ecology it looks all good but what else so it also supports the livelihood of many uh, about 30 million uh, livelihoods are supported by the people employed in fisheries and aquaculture uh, government is uh, taking a step by has been uh, introduced the flagship scheme of pradhan mantri madhya sampada yojana and uh, which aim to boost the growth of aquaculture and fisheries in the country. it also aimed to make this aquaculture industry highly rewarding because most of the farmers employed are the small scale farmers so inclusivity of the aquaculture uh, imparts the point that it needs to sustain their livelihood by generating larger income so that requires a sustainable growth in terms of economical aspect for these people so here we are trying to promote skill training and knowledge transfer at mrc along with technological interventions for the same uh how uda comes into the picture so let's take the two phase uh, phase of this multifaceted uda framework the one is the marine environment as a part of the economy so what we are trying to say that the anthropogenic activities have taken up recklessly what i mean here in terms of uh, capture fisheries a lot of by catch is also captured while the uh, wild fry fishing in terms of aquaculture a rampant increase in the land of aquaculture can generate conflicts with agriculture and salt grains Uh, as well as mangrove destruction is one of the key uh, problems or the uh, attributor of mangrove destruction is most of the time given to the rise of aquaculture second is the digital oceans where we are saying the tech for good or the maintaining the inclusivity or equitability of the increasing aquaculture in the country and uh, what is the idea here is the sensors can see much more than what human eyes can do there are a lot, whole lot of hardware complexities involved regarding sensors as my colleagues has pointed out that they can be acoustic they can be vision sensors and what all it helps us is to like aid to the to see to understand and to share framework so here let's begin with understanding the very basic of digital transformation so under the digital transformation i would like to uh, bring the msp umbrella so this umbrella of msp it likes to bring the coordinated decision of the stakeholders like fisheries aquaculture uh, energy transport as well as the conservation and recreation of the uh, benthic uh, ecosystem so idea is you need to take the justified allocation of resources so that the all the steps between these stakeholders are coordinated and no uh, resource conflicts takes place so what are its application so in short i would like to say that the justified allocation would bring ecological social and economical harmony in terms of uh, harmony of e ecological it would mean a better term would be ecological sustainability while uh, for the policy makers this msp can be a data driven tool so this is a data driven tool for uh, policy making in terms of roi or the return on investment we are already moving uh, under the government scheme of pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana which aims to reward the growth and uh, growth of aquaculture so idea here is if i talk about the aquaculture growth so are we really focusing on the productivity or are we uh, more concerned with the increasing area so uh, my colleague uh, shushank will point out next about what is area concerns regarding the aquaculture expansion finally productivity as well as data thanks i think with this uh, shlok has concluded his presentation for today and next we'll move on to the next presentation which is by uh, sushank uh, chigipalli who is from iit kharagpur and he's going to be talking about uh, aquaculture demographic digital mapping uh, so i'd like to call upon uh, sushank uh hello everyone uh, very good afternoon and uh, i'm shushank chitrapati uh, an undergraduate student from the department of civil engineering at iit kharagpur uh, i'm a summer uh, research intern at maritime research center pune uh, so uh, i wish you all a very happy world oceans day and uh, i'm currently working on open pond agriculture demographic mapping using satellite imagery and computer vision uh, so uh, um mangrove forests uh, sequester carbon much faster than other forests so they are vital in fight against the climate change when mangroves are degraded or lost due to uh, coastal agriculture uh, particularly shim farming uh, they release uh, stored carbon stock back into the atmosphere thus uh, significantly contributing to the greenhouse gas emission uh, nutrient transport due to this clearing of mangroves to adjacent ecosystems like uh, oceans uh, uh, cause of biodiversity loss uh, such as seagrass uh, 
meadows and coral reefs, and also uh, exacerbates the climatic variables. Uh, the extensive uh, clearing of uh, not only mangroves but also the agricultural land uh, led to the conflict between agriculture and shrimp farming, resulting in land and water degradation. Uh, this shift has affected traditional livelihoods and employment uh, opportunities of locals uh, as aquaculture is less labor intensive uh, uh, compared to agriculture. Uh, despite these efforts, uh, they play a vital role in uh, food security and the economy. So it is crucial to find a balance through uh, sustainable practices. Uh, this requires identifying suitable land for aquaculture and tracking uh, aquaculture demographic changes in the landscape to enhance uh, species planning. Next. Uh, uh, Remote sensing, particularly using synthetic aperture radar, SAR imagery of, uh, of Copernicus data space, is uh, crucial for my project on mapping aquaculture demographics. Uh, uh, SAR's ability to penetrate through uh, clouds and vegetation, which allows us to collect consistent and reliable data regardless of weather conditions, uh, ensuring continuous monitoring of uh, coastal uh, aquaculture areas. Uh, this technology covers a uh, uh, large area with uh, less revisit time and also reduces the need for extensive feedback. Uh, this helps us to monitor the ponds at very low uh, low order cost. Uh, unlike traditional surveying methods, uh, which are labor intensive, uh, remote sensing provides object to high resolution data that can be uh, analyzed with advanced uh, technologies like uh, uh, geographic information system, GIS, and computer vision. Uh, we, we use three computer vision models for our process, uh, ResNet Deep, Deep Lab and uh, Temporal Convolution Networks. Uh, this enables spatial uh, mapping, precise spatial mapping, tracking of uh, changes over time, uh, supporting uh, uh, sustainable agriculture management and minimizing conflict with uh, other marine regions. Next. Now, uh, in my research, uh, we utilize uh, uh, Sentinel-2 data due to its high resolution multispectral imagery, uh, which is crucial for identifying changes in land use and vegetation and health. Uh, additionally, we uh, integrate OpenStreetMap dataset uh, to enhance uh, the accuracy of spatial maps. Uh, we use sensing technology to precisely identify the graphic uh, graphic coordinates of agriculture points. This accuracy is crucial for uh, detailed spatial mapping. Uh, ensuring that we know exactly where these ponds are located. Uh, by measuring the area of each pond by demarcating them, we can access the scale of agriculture activities and uh, want to the expansion over time. Uh, this data is essential for evaluating the environmental uh, footprint of agriculture. So uh, understanding the lifespan of agriculture ponds, uh, which uh, ranges from 1 to 22 years, uh, helps in uh, planning sustainable practices uh, and predicting future productivity. Mm -hmm. And and it's also useful for developing uh, sustainable management funds. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, in in this uh, image, in the right in the right image, we can see how uh, how uh, how we can uh, uh, see the agriculture ponds are encroaching upon the, the surrounding areas. Uh, so uh, by tracking these changes, uh, we can effectively monitor uh, environmental impacts such as deforestation and increased carbon emission over time. This information is crucial for developing sustainable management plans that balance the economic benefits of uh, agriculture uh, with the needs to protect fossil ecosystems. Uh, additionally, the data helps policymakers to mitigate uh, negative effects and promote uh, practices that ensure costly environments, long-term sustainability and resilience. Uh, in, in the left side image, we can see how uh, ma mangroves are growing themselves naturally uh, just by changing the, uh, by understanding the hydrodynamic flow patterns of uh, of the local area. So, uh, revegetation of abundant uh, agricultural regions should also be priority to for uh, integrated coastal zone management. Uh, a time series of very high spatial uh, resolution optical Satellite images reveal that the trend in the evolution of man, uh, of the of these mangrove forests within the aquaculture ponds. Uh, the results showed that uh, the mangroves are expanding both inside and outside the pond. So uh, next, with this uh, next, with this I conclude my presentation and uh, I wish you all once again a very happy World Ocean Day. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you. Thanks, Shushan. Uh, now we have a concluding uh, presentation for this topic, and uh, I'd like to call upon uh, Aryan Awad from IIT Kharagpur. He's going to be speaking on the topic collision avoidance system using AIS data. Uh, so, Aryan, you can take over. Good evening, everyone. Uh, 
I am Aryan Abad. Uh, I'm currently a third year undergraduate at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and I'm currently pursuing a Bachelor's of Technology in Mining Engineering. I'm also a summer research intern at the Maritime Research Center, where I'm working on a project to develop an enhanced collision avoidance system. The need for the basically this project deal, deals with de developing an automated system for detecting collision probabilities based on state of the art AI models and satellite image data. Now, first, to understand the importance of the project, we need to realize the need for a collision avoidance system. So, as you all know, uh, maritime transport serves as a cornerstone of the global economy, facilitating international trade and exchange of goods across the continent. Currently, as we speak, there are over 100,000 ships sailing simultaneously at the sea across the entire world. And to promote the global economy, the ship traffic has surged by a great number since the last few years, and it has almost quadrupled from the period of 1992 to 2012. And even as we speak, it's going at an astounding rate of 10% every year. With such increase in maritime traffic, the pollution risks are also bound to increase. And as you can see from the data, about one third of all the accidents related to marine traffic are related to are related to collisions, and these incidents not only cause a financial risk, financial loss of over two billion dollars every year, but also cause an irreversible damage to the environment and marine life around the pollution area. Now, since we have developed understood the need for a collision avoidance system, let us take a look at the existing technologies to solve this problem. Now, first, we have radar and remote sensing technologies that use on device sensors to detect the presence of nearby ships. And the problem with these type of technologies is the data, input data for these sensors is very limited and they cannot accurately predict the trajectories of the ships around them and can only predict their locations. And then we have the cold compliances. The cold compliance basically stands for the uh, Convention of Maritime uh, Laws for Ship Regulations and Transport. And these laws are basically a set of rules that were established in 1972. And since then, the ship traffic, marine traffic has increased so much that they are not sufficient anymore to prevent all the collisions that can happen in high traffic dense areas. And then we also have some algorithmic methods that utilize pre-defined data or knowledge and only offer a rule-based approach to our preventing collisions they do not they cannot take into account the real time data and this is one of the major drawbacks so looking at all these drawbacks i have proposed a new method which uses uh, both the ais and satellite data and also the state of the art ai techniques to solve this problem now with sat uh, satellite data readily available it's almost imperative to use this this for our project and the main reason is with the availability of SAR data, it's very easy to recognize high, uh, ships in high traffic areas from the satellite over a huge area, not just the areas pertaining to one or two particular ships. With monitoring such a huge area, we can develop algorithms that can detect the location and orientations of multiple ships and detect the collision prob probabilities in case there are any. Also, for uh, while dealing with uh, the satellite data, we can use state-of-the-art AI models, which basically use computer vision technologies like the UNet, ResNet, or even transformer models that can very accurately detect the location and orientations of each and every ship present inside the area and can calculate probabilities of collisions even if there are very minimal chances. This is just a high-level overview of how our project implementation is going to look like. And this is the data that will be captured by the satellite. And mostly we'll be focusing on areas that have very high marine traffic and hence high pollution risks. And as you can see, the we can identify the position and orientations of each ship present in the particular region. And we can sort of map the commonly taken ways and calculate the pollution probabilities and risks based on certain threshold values. So this was the idea of my project, and thank you, everyone. Also, wish all of you a very happy World Thank you, uh, thanks, Aryan. Thanks for your presentation. Um, so this was the end of the topic uh, uh, called digital transformation. Uh, we lost a uh, slope in between. He was still left with a couple of more slides, but uh, because of like internet connectivity that he's facing right now.
Um, he requested if he can continue with the presentation. I'm not sure if uh, he has been able to join us or not, but uh, by by the end of the other intern, by the end of the other presentations that we have, he might um, have uh, slow joints again and complete finish his presentation later on. Uh, but right now we move on to the next topic, which is underwater radiated noise management. Uh, I'd like to call on uh, Akshita Mangal from uh, from IIT Delhi to uh, make her presentation. She's currently working as an MRC fellow, and she'll be speaking on the topic ambient uh, noise mapping. Good evening, everyone. I'm Akshita Mangal, and I'm currently a research fellow at MRC, and I'm also a fourth year writer at IIT Delhi, and coming from my major is in mathematics and computing. So the topic of my presentation will be ambient noise mapping, and here is the flow of the lead, mathematical equation, source level, transformation loss, conclusion, and differences. So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you the topic that I am going to speak about, which is the estimated uh, radiated noise. So the estimation of radiated noise from the marine vessels has become an important research challenge, considering that our marine animals basically use acoustic signals to communicate to each other, there is no, because they're most of them are blind, just the way we have dolphins. So the only way they can communicate is through the acoustic signals. So shipping noise is basically the single source of the ambient noise in the ocean. Now, because of the human interference in the oceans, the sound, these sound signals actually interfere with the signals produced by the animals. So there is a need for us to measure, to at least get the idea of where the, the source level is more, where this noise is less, etc. So the Indian Ocean region, the main topic or the research arena for me was the Indian Ocean region and has it has emerged as the most critical sea area in the 21st century. The shipping traffic due to the merchant marines and the naval deployments have seen a manifold rise in the Indian Ocean region. Now, why is there a need for such, such, such major noise? Enhanced shipping traffic directly translates to a significant increase in the low frequency ambient noise levels and this impacts the acoustic habitat degradation. Just because of this much of the shipping traffic, due to, maybe due to the, uh, you could say, because of the trade, because of the military purposes, because of the reasons, this leads to acoustic habitat degradation, which has a very, very major impact on the aquatic animals and also the coral reefs or maybe the other habitat over there. Marine species are known to depend on sound for functions like foraging, communication, navigation, finding mates for breeding and more. Naval warships need to evade detection by their adversaries and thus have a critical requirement for acoustic stealth. Precise estimation of the radiated noise from the marine vessels will contribute to the acoustic capacity building and go a long way in ensuring effective realization of the underwater domain awareness. Now, coming, I actually mean by is this, is that noise is just a normal equation, a mathematical equation that, 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 it, that it follows. So noise level is equal to the source level minus the transmission loss plus some of the error terms. Just because this noise calculation is everything and update every empirical thing in a mathematical equation there is some of the error terms. That's why we have the error term with us. So essentially my topic or you could say this, uh, uh, this research work was divided into two parts. First of all, calculating the source level and then calculating the transmission loss and finally clubbing both of them together, um, just subtracting them, we can get the noise level of a particular region. So SL basically represents the initial intensity of the sound source. The re uh, received noise level is the NL. It represents the sound intensity at the receiver's location. Now this noise level will be further, uh, you could say, uh, will uh, will be able to frame a heat map using the basically the transmission loss, or it accounts for the attenuation of the sound energy due to the sound waves over distance. No, source level. So what happens is that the calculation of source level basically come from different different models. There has been a lot many models, like four of them I have kind of listed. We can model the Norris and Harvey model, Harbor, Porpoise model, the Sonar performance models. So basically these models have different different time zones. And also they were they were effective, or you could say the most effective in different different arenas. But the status quo is that the model with the kind of modeling the ships and the infrastructure that we have, predicate models are the most famous models. So it's important to note that specific models and methodologies can vary depending on the particular source of interest and the available data or information. These models provide a foundation for estimating the source levels, but there are adaptations. So essentially the predicate model cannot be used everywhere there are different bathymetric profiles sound profiles for different different areas for our purpose we have kind of made necessary changes and adaptations 
A Vitic model or the Vitic Incarnate model is widely used for estimating the source levels of the ship noise. It takes into account parameters such as ship speed, ship tonnage, propeller, characteristics, and the operating conditions. Now, what we basically we generated a data set using the Vitic Incarnate model, and this being also been trained on data trees and the real world recorded data clubbed together after proper validation has been used. Now this data that we finally got has been to train artificial AI by the first cleaner that AI to the data noise prediction use model from the data from the AI. From this data that we got we were able to get a source level. Next step was the, so for the transmission deep of the waves in the Indian Ocean region, taking into surf and other uh, interactions, multipath property efforts, transmission loss. Now, uh, further, over spine implementation has used a This function made by ERA is the numerical integration of the wave equation. Now, the model actually just we got data for the range model and then we use a deep neural network. Now, why? Uh, the part of the RAM requires in and the with profile, sound profile, CB, identity, sensor, and the capital. We can to accurately estimate the transmission loss. Now, we can look at the thing, but it's even that particular data, right? And just uh, Shita, I'm I'm sorry for there uh, in one of you can answer. Uh, let's move to the next, uh, Mr. Uh, it's not audible at all. Then we have uh, Shweta Varshini from IIT Madras to make her presentation now. Good evening, one and all. Uh, I'm Shweta Varshini, pursuing my beta chemical engineering from IIT Madras, now on MRC intern. Happy to present my topic today underwater radiated noise management. And we will start with two important questions to be answered. Why is this topic and who are important? So let's start with the section of why. Here we will be discussing about the importance of the topic. Firstly, we have protecting marine life. As we all know, uh, going underwater, the intensity of light goes or uh, reduces. And the only effective way of communicating or sensing things would be through sound. Accordingly, marine animals, especially waves, dolphins, and fishes rely heavily on sound for communication, navigation, finding food, mates, or warning each other of dangers, and for all their basic needs. So you are and disturb these sound signals of the animals, and also excessive are and can uh, stress the animals, and which can lead to organal damages. Overall, it collapses the whole uh, marine ecosystem. Secondly, we have scientific research. Almost all scientific researchers underwater uh, rely on sound recordings for data. Excessive URN again disturbs the sound recordings and makes it difficult for the uh, scientists or researchers to collect accurate data. Thirdly, we have national security. URN management uh, focuses on um, noise friendly military vessels, which makes it harder for the enemies to detect uh, our military vessels and enhancing the national security. Now we will uh, move on to the who section. Here I have listed down important stakeholders involved in URN management, environmental groups, marine researchers, shipping industry, military industry, sorry, military and regulatory bodies, fishing industry, general public and tourism industry. Moving on, here uh, we will be discussing how UDA framework acts as a tool for URN management. It helps in data collection and sharing, improved monitoring and enforcement, collaboration with stakeholders, and cost effectiveness. UDA framework relies on various technical methods such as sensors, satellite imaging, modeling and stimulation, and other digital tools to gather information about the underwater activity, and also uh, helps in collect real-time data collection for monitoring purpose. Since there's already an existing UDA frame uh, infrastructure, it helps us to reduce the additional costs associated with uh, delicate URN monitoring programs. Moving on, uh, this is something interesting about the topic. Uh, not like any, uh, like it's a unique advantage of URN management. 
UDA, MSB and URN management all works together and helps each other. In case of UDA and URN management, UDA can leverage its data collection capabilities to monitor URN levels and un identify noise hotspots. Wider versions through URN management can improve UDA's effectiveness. In case of MSB and URN, URN management contributes to achieving the sustainable use of marine resources that MSB aims for. In case of UDA and MSB, both benefit from a comprehensive understanding of marine environment. They can share data and collaborate to achieve their goals. Here I have listed down technological and policy interventions that are in place of action and under research. In uh, coming to technological interventions, we have quieter ship design, quieter sonar technology, bubble dabbing devices that helps in reducing noise from the propeller gravitation and noise cancelling technologies that are under research and improved underwater monitoring systems. In policy interventions, we have international regulations, economic incentives, marine protected areas, environmental impact assessments, research and development funding, public awareness campaigns. In this project, I like to view the topic from environmental and socio-economical dimensions and study the potential area of applications, do a literature review of technological and policy interventions and identify gaps and solutions through these interventions and of course ensure a sustainable development. And I like to conclude my presentation with a sweet quote, save the oceans as earth won't be the same if the major part of its constant goes polluted and dead. Thank you and happy world's ocean day. Thank you, Shweta. Uh, with this, we conclude uh, the previous set of topic that we had, uh, which was on URN management. And next, we move on to the last topic of today, which is maritime security in UDA. And we have one presenter for the same. Uh, can I please have Shraddha Gajival from Simbaisi School of Liberal Arts to make her presentation? Uh, Shraddha is going to be speaking on the topic maritime security in UDA, exploring the non-traditional threats in China. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today's presentation is a brief about my topic, um, uh, about my project on the topic maritime security in the underwater domain. Uh, moving on to the introduction, uh, maritime domain awareness is a critical component of maritime security, which includes the effective understanding of anything associated with maritime domain that could impact security, safety, economy, or the environment. However, this concept needs to be extended to include you, uh, underwater domain awareness, which specifically addresses the unique and increasingly prominent challenges and threats lurking beneath the ocean surface. The hidden depths of the ocean, once considered inaccessible and secure, have now emerged as arenas of potential conflict and illicit activities. This presentation um, on my project aims to explore the non-traditional threats and challenges in the underwater domain, such as submarine espionage, sabotage of undersea underwater cables, and underwater drug smuggling, etc. In the same context, the main aim of the presentation would be analyzing the policy gaps and the role and the importance of underwater domain awareness framework in mitigating these issues. The topic of this, uh, the choice of this topic is underscored by contemporary examples such as the alleged uh, Russian sabotage of undersea cables, Chinese spy ships lurking in the Indian Ocean, and the use of narco drones or autonomous underwater vehicles for smuggling drugs to Australia, illustrating the pressing need for improved underwater security measures. Moving on, a very uh, small brief about the issues. These underwater threats, as mentioned above, pose a significant challenges to national and global security. Submarines with their stealth capabilities gather intelligence undetected, exemplified by uh, Cold War incidents like the Soviet K-129, um, etc. Undersea cables, uh, critical for global communications, are vulnerable to sabotage, as seen in the 2017 Syria outage, impacting financial markets and military communications. Furthermore, drug cartels increasingly use semi-submersibles for narcotics transport, complicating detection efforts due to their low profile and ability to operate beneath the surface. Moving on, um, 
underwater maritime security confronts significant policy gaps characterized by a fragmented regulations inadequate technological infrastructure and limited international collaboration current policies lack coordination among stakeholders and fail to address the rapid advancements in autonomous underwater vehicles and unmanned drones etc insufficient technological capabilities particularly in regions like the indian ocean hampers the effective underwater awareness additionally the reluctance to share the sensitive data due to national security concerns hinders collective efforts to combat underwater these underwater threats and uh, moreover legal definitions and frameworks are outdated too complicating the application of rights and duties for operations uh, or activities which involve uncrewed vessels or remote control uh, activities and most importantly the maritime domain awareness framework which was established in 2005 overlooks underwater threats lacking comprehensive strategies for detection and mitigation addressing these gaps requires a multifaceted approach to tackle these issues now comes into the picture the uda framework the uda framework is pivotal in enhancing maritime security and resource management by providing robust threat detection and <clears throat> uh, response capabilities through the deployment of advanced sensor networks uda enhances surveillance and improved monitoring system uh, um, that ensures uh, that potential threats are detected early allowing for prompt and effective responses um and moreover strengthening international collaboration is another significant advantage of implementing a uda framework it uh, encourages data sharing and cooperative efforts, uh, efforts among nations addressing common underwater threats more effectively by fostering uh, or developing international cooperation the uda framework helps in creating a unified approach to managing and mitigating underwater security risks moreover The UDA framework optimizes uh, resource utilization and promotes sustainable economic development by providing precise information on underwater resources it enables better planning and execution of security strategies reducing the strain on military resources uh, lastly the UDA framework integrates data from various sources including sonar systems satellite imagery and maritime patrols uh, to provide a comprehensive understanding of underwater activities leading to effective identification and analysis of certain threats and response strategies under the uda framework are multifaceted involving rapid response units and coordination of international naval forces by providing real time data to decision makers the uda framework enhances the ability to respond effectively to potential threats um to conclude um the evolving nature of uh, these underwater threats necessitates a proactive and collaborative approach to maritime security the intergovernmental organizations such as bimstec iora and the indian ocean naval symposiums and many more should incorporate the uda framework to strengthen their security efforts and address the unique challenges of the underwater domain the uda framework offers a promising solution enabling nations to navigate the uncharted waters of underwater security with greater confidence and effectiveness and these are my list of references yeah that's about it thank you so much thanks shraddha thank you so much uh, so uh, with this we conclude today's presentations on various topics including sediment management climate change global economy digital transformation underwater radiated noise and maritime security uh we shall now move on to the next segment which is also the concluding segment wherein we will have the esteemed dignitaries uh, who will share the and we will request them to share their feedback and also uh, their kind remarks so we have with us uh, mr mb ramana murthy from the national center for coastal research uh, sir has been involved with uh, with the deep ocean mission as well and he uh, currently is working with uh, the national center for coastal research of the indian ministry of uh, earth sciences uh, so can we have uh, you for your kind remarks now okay, thank you very much and then first of all uh, happy ocean day and thanks to commander arnab for calling me for this uh, webinar especially and then it is almost like a different kind of webinar because i have been attending uh, in world ocean day where i will be giving talk and then others will be listening i think it was uh, something different than what it is there and happy to see a very good presentations by many number of students 
they are enthusiastic and then also some of the information what they are gathered and then presented it is apt and then uh, uh, they are in right direction and i also compliment mrc uh, for this important uh, initiative of uh, colleague interns especially from academia most of the things most of the people i think the students are from the iits which makes it uh, uh, lot of lucrative for the future blue economy policy that is going to be implemented by the government of india in fact though it is only at the beginning uh, but most of the things have been captured by the students from the various iits and then other universities for that and my compliments to all the students who have presented the important topics which is relevant for the blue economy because i will be reading some of the topics here and there from the policy perspective and technical perspective i am really happy to see such a wonderful comparison from the youngsters and then who gathered the right kind of information and then projected today for that uh, so this is about the compliments from the my side but other side for the improvement of mrc uh, what i also suggest is i think some of the presentations uh, what they have presented on the right direction but uh, i feel that suppose if some more information is given to the students uh, instead of uh, starting from the scratch and then uh, getting into the uh, internship and then going forward maybe you can uh, uh, explore the opportunity of uh, some of the experts who are all specialized in uh, especially uda i am not telling exactly on the uda but applications related to the ocean so that will help them in identifying the right kind of problem so it also and uh, understanding the practical problems for the solutions what needed from the country in the future and also uh, while doing uh, such kind of uh, internship by the students they will also enjoy because they are actually implementing the what is required for the country and then it is being taken up by the some of the institutions within the country for that this is my first observation the second one is on the marine special planning uh, i think you are looking at in a different perspective but i saw when we develop msp uh, our focus was mostly on the uh, resources i think they focusing on the economy inclusive development what we call it as a society and then finally the ecosystem which is very important for the future generation and then how do we protect while balancing the development in the future for that mrc as such the perspective uh, when we see for that especially when we draw the msp uh, to update all the students also today on that i think mostly the runner knows about that we have a regulation called coastal zone regulation which talks from the high tide line in the sea that means where the water reaches up to the highest point and then 12 nautical miles into the sea this is where the maritime universities or maritime uh, boats will come into the picture but when it comes to the blue economy we are going beyond the maritime zone that means 12 nautical miles up to eej that is 200 nautical miles where msp plays a very important role uh, when we take about the territories of the indian water is concerned but of course msp is not restricted only to the eej it also goes beyond eej that is called as a international waters and then the treaty law how do we handle security in terms of survival and so on completely it is different once we cross the eej for that so these are all the some of the issues i think uh, uh, we should make students to be aware of those things and then so that because it is not possible for them also in the short time to get all those things and then present whatever is required for that but some information has been provided to the this youngster i am confident that i think they will really make wonders and wonders uh, what is required for the future for them especially uh, when we are seeing about 70% is covered by the ocean and either it is resources or climate if it is controlled by 30% from the land and what need to be done on the ocean when we have a 70% of the ocean which not only controls the climate but also helps in so many other ways in terms of resources transport food especially fisheries and other things but now our greediness uh, we are slightly spoiling and their thing that so climate change is also one of the major cause of uh, our own uh, uh, not having a thinking about how do we protect the future and then conserve our for the future generation for that so that makes it more understandable understandable and then also to see how do we protect and conserve for the 
our next generation water rapidly. I think this time you might have seen this temperature is going up to very high as much as that. These are all the consequences of our luxury and greediness for that. So it is not that we don't want development for that, but at the same time, how do we balance the development, uh, understanding the impact or damage that what you're causing to the uh, climate. The damage will happen in one day, but restoration will take, uh, it can be months, years, and even decades to get back to the normal sea level. So we have to be very cautious in conserving and protecting the ocean for the our future generation for that. And then all the presentations which were made by the youngsters are really wonderful, beautiful, and then it is apt for the uh, ocean for that. I don't want to bore because I think uh, you already taken a long presentation for that. If I speak more on that, again, I will also think that, oh, this guy is coming and presenting at last minute, a lot of stories for that. We should not do for that. Let us see how do we work together with youngsters and then see which they like and enjoy and contribute to the country and also to the world ocean. Thank you, uh, Starnob, and then thank you, moderator. I think your moderating was wonderful. I think it keeping in the time and then bringing all the people on the on board for that. Thanks to both of you and thanks to the MRC. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we definitely take note of the points that you have said. And uh, as you said, sir, we will uh, start our discussion with you and uh, request uh, your time so that we can present. Uh, because today there was a short time. We have been also doing a lot of documentation ourselves. And we would like to share those details with you and then work under your guidance to contribute to the larger national cause. And uh, 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 your words will be definitely uh, be important for us because, as you rightly said, sir, I mean, since we work on policy, the government's uh, views and the policies are very important. I am part of the uh, Blue Economy Task Force of FIKI. Uh, uh, so uh, we have some in, uh, understanding, but definitely there is a lot more to be done. And there are so many aspects uh, to be learned. So we will definitely take this conversation forward and really thank you for sparing your valuable time and joining us today, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Next sir. We can end the thing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, all of you made a very good presentation, as sir has also acknowledged. Uh, we are quite pleased with your work and we need to take it forward uh, even more. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you to all. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks to all the interns all the fellows and all the internal team members for making uh, this wonderful uh, day, special for all of us and for wait, uh, doing a great job at your presentation. Thanks a lot. With this, we close the webinar.